Hello everybody, welcome to the channel. Uh, today I'm gonna go ahead and play a game that um, I really have been enjoying the last few months and it's actually an old Avalon Hill game. Uh, I owned this back in the late 70s, early 80s. I think the last time I played it on board was 1979, I wanna say, maybe 80. Things are foggy that far back. But um, this is a game that I've played 100% online on Vassal. And um, it's a relatively easy game to find online uh, to buy a used copy of. Um, they're not relatively cheap, but really, in all honesty, I'll leave a link down below to a um, website where you can download the manual and all the rules. And you can actually play on Vassal. And there are a lot of people out there that would love to play this game on Vassal with you. So um, if you get a chance, try to do that. But the game I'm talking about here is uh, Victory in the Pacific here. And this is an old Avalon Hill game about uh, the Battle of the Pacific War. And it's only an eight turn game. I mean, you know, it's not a relatively long game, uh, but a lot of thinking, a lot of planning ahead. Um, basically chess in, the o chess in the open sea. Uh, it's it's really a fun game and uh, one that I think that if you try it out you you really enjoy So in this video, I'm gonna go through um, the basics show you the map show the game pieces Talk about um, how the game plays a little bit about how the control is and then I'm gonna share a game with you That uh, I played against a man by the name of John Sharp. He's uh, my mentor on this game when I signed up for the ladder for the Midwest open ladder um, I hadn't played this game since 1979 and uh, he was kind enough to play through a game with me and tell me the latest um, strategies and how people play and all of that and uh, so uh, from there I played him one game and then I went on to play six games in the tournament did horrible but I did manage to squeak out a win on my last game so uh, that was kind of fun but I learned a lot and uh, it was basically a trial by fire since then I've been playing this game a lot uh, I'm on another uh, play by uh, email ladder for it and um, a lot of people who love playing this game out there. So uh, if, if this game interests you, I, I would suggest you uh, check out the link below uh, to a website that's run by John Pack, I believe. And um, he just has everything you need to know about this game. And it's a really a fun game and, and a game that you could actually play without actually owning a physical copy if you don't want to go that route. But let me show you, I'm going to show you with my physical copy one, this is one of the games I did manage to save from uh, uh, the 70s, uh, along with Panzer Blitz. This is the other game, but um, let's take a look at it and uh, I'll go through the uh, pieces, the board, and how you play the game. Okay, so here's the board that you play on and you see that we have uh, different regions on the board, different sections. And the whole idea is controlling certain parts of this board here. And for each part of the board that you control, you get so many points, you get point of control, and that's what keeps track up here. And when the Imperial Japanese Navy gets points, it goes in this direction. When the United States Navy gets points, it goes in that direction here. So you can see underneath each one of these, like Japan here is worth three points to the uh, Japanese player. The Allied player, it's worth three points also. And some of these are worth different amounts of points. Like Japan, it's three points of control here, but when the Allies control, it's only one point of control there. The way you control that area is by having your pieces, your patrol pieces in that area and eliminating the enemy or the opponent's pieces in there. So if uh, at the end of the turn, there's only uh, Japanese naval pieces here, uh, the Japan gets the points. If there's only ally naval pieces here, then the allies get the point for it. And you represent each area by a flag. So if you control the area, if uh, Japan controls the area, you have that flag. If the U.S. controls the area, you have that flag. And that means a difference as to how far one can travel because um, a Japanese player can travel through this one and into the surrounding areas, but they have to stop once they enter an ally controlled area. Same way with the ally. Allies can uh, move through this and into another area, but once they come into this area and they go into a Japanese controlled area, 
uh, they immediately have to stop. So if they're here, they immediately have to stop. If they go here, they immediately have to stop. If they go this direction, they can go a couple areas if they have the movement points for them. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But the main idea is to control these areas. Now, there are also other things inside the area that you control. And these help you with land-based air and also um, just keeping out the opponent. So we have Saipan here. Uh, if you control that, and that's marked with a control point like this, or it's flipped over if it's the allies. And um, if you control that one there, that means that the allies can't have any land-based air here, but they can here. And they can also um, port their ships here, but they can't port them here because the Japanese control them. The Japanese can port their ships here, but they can't port they can't port them here. Now these are islands that you can also that you have ports that have small ports that you can put your ships to, but you also have major ports here. Like truck here is a major one for Japan. Um, naval shipyard over here. We have Australia down here for the Allies. Uh, Cylon over here for the British, and. Uh, down over here we have Pearl Harbor. Let me let me move this over a little bit so you can see Pearl Harbor here. Let's slide that on over, and there it is. So there's Pearl Harbor, uh, Samoa down the U.S. mandate. You can also um, stay as far as the Allies go. So you can see this is a good sized map. I got my camera fully out, and I can only show part of the map. So these areas are controlled by ship, ship counters. And um, this is a typical ship counter here. We have um, carriers, we have, not carriers, but we have cruisers, battleships, and this is an aircraft carrier. And for the US here, we have um, a battleship there, carrier here, cruisers here. Now, the way that um, these areas are in control is that if you have what's called a patroller, and that's what these counters are right side up, if they are in the area patrolling, you control that area. So the U.S. controls that area because it has patrollers. The Japanese control this area because they have patrollers. Now, if you want to control this area over here, what you'd have to do is you have to move patrollers over there, and they're going to fight with the U.S. here. The patrol ships can only go two spaces, so they can only go here or here or here, so they can't go as far. But when they're flipped over, they're called raiders. And raiders can move up to three spaces. So this, this raider, if it started here, can go here, and it can go all the way over here to Pearl if it wanted to. So raiders, the only problem with raiders is that if they end up in an area with patrollers, uh, they don't control that area. If we were um, to look at this right now, if this particular unit eliminated both of these, it would be a neutral. Nobody would own claim to this. But if one of these eliminated this one, let's say that one was left, they would have control. So that would become a US controlled area. So the raiders are used to go invade further out uh, the patrollers are used to lay claim to areas and each maneuvers a little bit differently which we'll talk about here in a minute now again the whole idea is to control different areas and that's where all of your points come from so let's say we're we're adding up this board right now and, and you know we'd have flags on all of this board but we're just going to use this part just to show you how um, the addition goes but here we have uh, the U.S. Uh, the Allies have the Mariana Islands and the South Pacific Islands. They control these two islands because they had patrollers there at the end of the turn. The Imperial Japanese Navy, they have patrollers here and here at the end of the turn. Probably would be more like that. Uh, they have patrollers here and here at the end of the turn. So when we added... When we add this up, we'd see that the Japan has three points of control and three points of control here. And then the Allies have one point of control here and one point of control here. So we have six 
to two. So that's a net gain of four for the Japanese. So the Japanese would be four points of control at this point in the game if that were the only ones that were, let's say none of these were contested yet. It won't be that way in the actual game, but let's just say that. So the other thing that control areas are what's called land-based air. And this is the uh, Japanese land-based air, and this is the ally land-based air. Now these can only go into areas where you have control of one of the islands, one of the land islands here. Um, you have to have control of that or the area has to be in control. So for example, let's say we had this, this here. And let's say in this particular one, we had US control there. So what this means right here is that uh, up here in Japan, in the Japanese uh, islands, we have the Japanese control. So no American land-based air can come up here because there's no place for them to land, no control up there. However, in the, Mar in the Marianas here, islands, we have an island here that's controlled. We also have truck here, which is Japanese controlled. And I should put that as a major port here. Let's put that like that. And so they control that. So here we can have either the allies or the Japanese land-based air could be placed here. Now over here in Indonesia, we have, um, let's say we had Japan controlling both these ports right here. Um, we could have the Japanese land-based air also here, but we can also have the Americans here because, or the allies, the Allied land-based area here, because you can see that they own this part of the island here, which connects to this. So anything that connects to this region, you can bring a land-based area. Now, land-based areas are really powerful units in this game. And like I said, if one of these are left here, um, they can pretty much control this area. For example, the only thing that could shoot at the air units are another air unit or aircraft carrier that could launch aircraft to fight this. But if you had this cruiser here, or even this battleship here, they cannot attack uh, land-based air. Uh, land-based air can attack them, but they can't attack this. The land-based air can just stay right here. They can't attack it. So they would eventually have to leave. They couldn't control this area and they would have to leave it. So this area would flip on over to Imperial Japanese control at the end of the turn if it ended up this way. But these units would eventually leave. They just can't do anything here to that unit. So you have to be able to eliminate all of the enemy um, to stay here. This unit here can attack them without them ever shooting back. So it's not worth it for them to stay. They would retreat uh, and get out of this area and this unit would maintain control here and switch it over to the Imperial Japanese Navy. So the air units are very important. Aircraft carriers can attack in the air. The land-based units can attack in the air. The battleships and the cruisers can only at attack on the sea. So we have two different types of battles here. We have day battles and we have night battles. During the day battles, the aircraft can fire and the aircraft can use their aircraft, aircraft carrier uh, attack here. At night, the only thing they can fire is the aircraft cannot fire and the uh, aircraft from the carriers cannot fire, but the battleships and the cruisers, they can fire back and forth. They can also shoot at the aircraft carrier. Now this aircraft carrier does have an attack factor right there, which allows them to shoot at the sea-based ships. So this particular aircraft carrier can also shoot here and shoot here, but the only disadvantage here is that when this one shoots towards these guys, they can shoot back. If this one does not shoot, it's screened out by these two, which is what you want. Aircraft carriers are extremely important in this game. Land-based errors are also extremely important. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these units here and how they attack and defend. So. 
The first number is their attack strength. This, this can attack and rolls one dice for the attack. Uh, this one gets to roll five dice for the attack. This one, one. This one can roll zero for a land, for a sea-based attack. It can have three attacks in the air, and that's what this number is here because these aircraft carriers have air attack strength and sea attack strength. S uh, battleships and cruisers only can attack on the water. Now, submarines are very special units in that they can go any place on the board. That's why uh, they have this asterisk here. And they don't have any defense because they can only strike and then they leave the area right away. So these can attack without any repercussions. The land-based air, they can attack, they get to roll three dice for their attack and they defend at four. So the second number is the defense strength. So if this one was attacking at this one here, um, it's gonna attack and it has three attacks there. And you're gonna roll three die and then you're going to see if any of them hit this and we'll talk about that in a minute so on these attack strengths we have four attacks there and that basically means you roll four dice to see if they attack this one you roll five but that little number right there that little circle right there means that that has an extra attack strength what that allows us to do is that generally when you roll four dice you have to roll four dice and if there's any sixes that means that particular um, attack hit on these ones here with circles around them, when you roll the die, you roll five die here, but anything that hits on five or six is a hit. Now, in this case, you roll one dice, but if it hits on a five or six, that's a hit. So these all get a bonus attack. So they all hit on fives right here, here, and here. All the rest of these are gonna hit on just sixes. So you roll four dice, but any die that is a six is a hit. So let's take these two ships and do an example. I'll show you an example of an attack. So these two ships are gonna attack each other so on. So if this ship rolls a six or five, that's a hit. This ship can only hit on a six. So this is rolls one die, this rolls one die, but if it's a six or a five, that's a hit. So this is a big advantage having this bonus number here. Now, once you do have a hit, you roll another die and let's say we rolled another die. We had a hit on this one. So we get to roll another die and that's two. So it can take one damage. So because it has two damage, this ship is gonna be sunk. If it was only a one, this ship would still survive. It would have damage on it, but it would still be uh, able to fight and move away. Now let's take these two here. So if this one were to roll its four die and it ended up with this, only this one would actually be a hit where it could do some damage. Once you rolled that, you'd roll a separate die, and let's say you got a three, then that means that this would take three damage. So this got one hit here, you roll another dice, that's three, this ship gets three damage. So it has six that it can work with. So three damage is just a three damage marker on it. So that would end up with a three damage marker on it. So now let's say this ship was to fire back now. So now this ship can fire back at this one. So this one's gonna fire with a five with bonus. So it's gonna fire five shots. And because it has the bonus, both the six and the five hit. So if we rolled our damage die, and let's say we had a five, now this has five damage on it. So because the five damage exceeded the four defense factor that it has, that ship is sunk and removed from the game. This ship can still go back to port and get that damage repaired, but this ship is still in the game with three damage. The five damage sunk this one. So you see that the bonus hits really do help you roll better. And um, these are very important assets to your Navy when you have the bonus hits. So that was a simple example of combat um, during the combat phase, which you'll see more of that. But um, like I said, we have, when you come into this area right here, and let's, let's say these six ships were in this area right now, uh, you have two different players. And so one player, and let me just get all this stuff in here so that we are official here. So this is a U.S. territory. And uh, they, they own, they have the control of these waters here. 
So these come in to do some combat. So you can decide if you want to have a day action or a night action. The day action means that only these two ships can fire because these two ships have aircraft on them and they can go out, fly out and attack. A night action means that only these ships can fire. Now this particular one can also fire at night, but this one cannot. This one has zero for its nighttime firing, nighttime combat. This one has one for nighttime combat. So if we got a night roll here, we would actually only do battle with these two ships. If we got a daytime, we'd only do battle with these two ships. So the way that works is that you roll die and whoever has the highest die gets to pick out the battle. Now there are other factors that go involved. If you pick a day battle, so let's say the uh, Japanese pick a day battle, you'd add one to this. If you control the area, you also add one to the die. So right now, if, we, if the US wanted a night battle, uh, the Japanese Navy wanted a day battle, the Japanese Navy would get plus one, the US Navy would get plus one for their area of control. So they would have a six, they would have a four. However, let's say that they wanted a day battle, the US Navy wanted a day battle, and the Imperial Japanese Navy wanted a night battle, then the Navy would get a plus two to the die roll. So they would actually have a seven here to a three. So they would still get the day battle. So depending on what one you go for, you have modifiers to the die. Depending on what area you are in, you have modifiers to the die. That picks day or night, and then from there you figure out the battle. So for example, if we had a day battle, then these two ships would be able to attack. Now because this is a day battle, these ships could either attack each other, or they could attack any of these ships. So this ship could attack all three, any three of these. This ship could attack any three of these um, on a day battle. Most likely you go aircraft carrier to aircraft carrier because you want to eliminate those first. Those are um, the powerful ships in this game. On a night battle, these four here would battle it out. Now, they could not fire at either one of these because they have to shoot these ships first. They have to shoot what's called screening ships first. Um, if, for example, let's say there was one less, let's say uh, there was a night battle and the Imperial Japanese Navy wanted to fire, they could fire both these at this one or they could also fire at this one too because it is uh, because there's only one ship screening the Japanese player could have these two battle out and then they could also fire at this one here but if you have two screens you have to fire at them first if you eliminated one you still had two then the next round you could fire at that one but right as it stands right now you'd have to fire at these two first on a night battle Okay, so let's look at the two different navies that we have. We have the Imperial Japanese Navy here and the Allied Navy here. Now, this is your start. Your starting force is actually all of these aircraft here, the U-boat, or the I-boat, I should say. All of these aircraft in the I-boat and all of these ships right here for the Imperial Japanese Navy. The Allies have most of their battleships um, in Pearl Harbor Row. Now, there's going to be... A special turn one that we will uh, that I'll go through with you and uh, where you actually attack all of these right away so you lose a lot of these the Americans are, lose a lot of these ships right away and then we have some other ships that are out on the map here um, that could get damaged the first turn also depending on where they show up we have group W X Y and Z and you roll a die to see where they come in so you don't know really know where they're at at the beginning so if you look here, you can see that the Japanese Navy is very, very large at the beginning of the game. But as the game progresses, they don't get much in the way of reinforcements coming in. Now, the U.S. Uh, doesn't start out as large, and they lose quite a bit in that special turn. Uh, but the advantage that the U.S. has, and we'll, we'll move the camera down here so you can see the other part. So the advantage that the U.S. has is that on turn two and beyond, it keeps adding and adding ships. Now, it doesn't add much. Up here, we have a lot of the British that come in. 
but they don't stay very long. You see that they start getting removed on turns four and five. So they don't stay in there very long and they're at the top of the map. Um, and you'll see when we start playing um, how they're, they're not as effective as you'd like them to be. But turn three, we get a little bit. Uh, turn four, we get some. Turn five, we get some. But if the Americans can hold out to turn six, turn six and turn seven are the two turns that turn this game around. You get a lot of ships and by then the Japanese Navy has been um, you know, winnowed down to a smaller group and uh, you can start steaming ahead and going into a lot of areas with all these ships. Then turn eight, we get a few more and a turn eight is when you stop. Now we do have an optional turn nine, um, but most of the time you don't play that too much. So uh, this game is only gonna go to turn eight for the victory. So you can see that the US continues to build up its ships and they get even higher quality because you notice that all of these aircraft carriers coming in, they have the bonus hits here. And all of these um, destroyers that come in, they also have the bonus hits. You can see up here that we don't have really much in the way of bonus hits on any of this up here. Uh, and the same way at the starting force there. And let me just bring the starting force down here. Let's see if you can see it. And the same way we, when you look at the starting force here, you see there's not a lot of bonus. We have a couple bonus numbers here, but they're only on the aircraft carrier. They're not on the destroyers. Over here, we start getting bonus numbers on the destroyers. And when you're able to roll a five or a six for a hit, that makes a big difference on your die rolls uh, quite a bit. Whereas when you look at the Imperial Japanese Navy, you see that we have a lot of ships with bonus attacks here. And even when even on turn four and turn five, uh, they have some really good uh, bonuses here. The starting fleet of the Americans do not have as much in the way of bonus hits here. So let me show you the map at the starting of the turn and we'll talk about that a little bit. All right, so let's take a look at our board layout at the beginning here. So we have everything set up here. Uh, we have our POC track, points of control track set at zero, zero. And uh, we'll work our way around here and show the control here. So at the beginning of the game, the US controls the Bay of Bengal, Indian Ocean, and the Coral Sea down here. Now, uh, we have some British ships here that are afloat in this area. Uh, they have control of Cylon and the Anandaman Islands. Um, we have two ships here ported at Singapore, which the U.S. has. They also have uh, some British ships and uh, land-based air in Indonesia. They control Indonesia at the beginning of the game. And they also have the Houston here. Now, at the beginning of the game, the U.S. fleet is pretty much frozen in place except for the Houston, the De Royer, the Exeter, and down here the two Australian ships here. Australia and Canberra are the only ones that the U.S. can move on the first turn. So as we pan on over here, Yokosama Naval Yard has all of these ships here. Now these ones that have flipped over to the Raider side these are the ones that are going to raid Pearl Harbor. They're going to attack Pearl Harbor on turn one. So the Japanese player decides which ones they want to go now. So the Raiders can be any ships with five or above. And so these are all the Raiders. So we have some battleships, some cruisers, and some aircraft carrier. All the rest here are patrollers and they're based at Yokosaka Naval Yard. We also have a uh, marine unit, which we haven't talked about, but we'll, we'll discuss this as we go along. And we also have an I-boat here. And up at the very top here, we have the six land-based airs that the uh, Imperial Japanese Navy starts out with. Now these, can, these have a special movement, as do the subs, where they can go any place on the map. But they can only go in areas that you have a land-based control. In other words, you have either a port or control of an island so they can they can go in this area they can go in this area um, they can go in this area because truck is here they can't go in this area because this is controlled by the u.s it's the only island they can land at so that you can't get land-based airs here up at the top here these islands are not controlled by anybody but atun is dutch harbor is controlled by the u.s north pacific ocean is not controlled by anybody so these are free and open waters 
Central Pacific is controlled by the U.S. and the island Midway is controlled there. Uh, Saipan is controlled by the Imperial Japanese Navy, as are the Mariana Islands. And I believe I said Indonesia was controlled by the U.S. South Pacific is controlled by the U.S. Truck is controlled by um, Imperial Japanese Navy. Uh, Lao is controlled by uh, the U.S. Port Mobley is also controlled by the U.S. So I got that on there. Guadalcanal is controlled by the U.S. Uh, Marshall Islands is controlled by the Japanese. Uh, these two islands are also controlled by the Imperial Japanese Navy. So we'll come on over here a little bit more. Australia is controlled by the U.S. or by allies, I should say. Coral Sea is also controlled by allies and has are the U.S. mandates and Hawaiian Islands. They also control Pearl Harbor, Johnson Island, Samoa, New Hebrides, and Guadalcanal. So all of those are controlled by the Allies. All of these ships here that are in these regions here are frozen in place. The only person that's going to be able to move would be the Imperial Japanese Navy. Over here we have Battleship Row right here and these are all the battleships that are basically docked in Pearl Harbor. These are out in the Hawaiian Islands as are the aircraft here. But all the rest of these Actually, you are allowed to shoot at the aircraft, so we'll say where the aircraft is patrolling Pearl Harbor there. These two are floating out in the islands here. So when the raid comes, they can attack all of these. They cannot attack these two here. Now we'll go back over to Australia here for a minute. Australia, we have four groups of location unknown. And in the game, it's known as Group W, Group X, Group Y, and Group Z. And after the raid in Pearl Harbor, these are rolled. We roll a die to see where these end up. Now they could end up coming in on turn two. They could end up coming in at Central Pacific. They could end up coming in the Hawaiian Islands, depending on what the roll is on the die. So we'll go through that on turn one. So this is our setup for turn one, as it sits on the map and the way the map is laid out. Okay, so we're all set up for turn number one on uh, Victory in the Pacific, and we'll cover that in the next video. Um, for the first two turns, I'll talk a lot about the procedures and how you go about uh, attacking and defending, uh, what the reasons are for the move, why they decide to move there, and uh, give you the best of my knowledge as to why my opponent and myself made those decisions. So I hope you join us in the next video. Stay tuned for that very soon. For those of you who stuck around this long, I really thank you for staying on. Please do subscribe and like the video. That helps out in the analytics and it helps get the video out there to more and more people. Look forward to having you around in the next video. Thanks again.